Os voy a dejar con León Krier, que muchos le conoceréis ya, supongo. Es un arquitecto que, que también eh, obtuvo el premio Driehaus. De hecho, fue, si no me equivoco, el primero en recibir el premio Driehaus. Y su obra representa perfectamente, se adapta perfectamente a esos valores que, que precisamente está promoviendo Richard Driehaus. Porque es un, es un representante bastante importante de esa arquitectura que, lejos de querer ir amoldándose a las tendencias arquitectónicas de moda, mantiene unos ideales que son constantes a lo largo de toda su obra y que tienen que ver con, con esos valores que, que al principio os contábamos que, que defendía el premio de House y el premio Rafael Manzano y que tienen que ver con la, con la preservación de la identidad cultural, con la, presenta, con la preservación de las tradiciones arquitectónicas y con la creación de, de entornos más sostenibles y más humanos. Buenas tardes. Si ustedes fueran alcaldes y decidieran poner en el mapa su ciudad, región o comarca, marcarla indebilmente de cool, deben aplicar la siguiente fórmula en dosis crecientes de potencia. Primero, Reemplazar las antiguas farolas del paseo por postes de luz XXL de diseño y color inquietante. El triple de altura, tres veces más numerosos y más caros y el triple de deslumbrantes es de rigor que la luz sea arrancada. Eh, anaranjada, vapor sodio. Segundo, conceder permiso de construcción para una manzana controvertida, muy controvertida, mejor, de edificios con altura, formas, carácter, proporciones, materiales y colores chocantes. en la mejor esquina, la más selecta, esquina, plaza, paseo, paisaje, línea de costa de su país y de su región. Toda oposición será vencida si usted se declara ecologista, estableciendo una zona de preservación, de desarrollo ¿Cómo se llama? San Viterno. O creando un centro de interpretación para los visitantes, porque los visitantes, por definición, son ignorantes. Nunca se debe formar. Tercero, y a pesar de todo lo dicho, multiplique con un factor inimaginable su área edificable. Sea la que sea, su densidad de población o ritmo de crecimiento, no importa. Importa multiplicar las superficies construibles. Para entonces la, la avalancha de desarrollo será imparable. No tenga miedo de inconsistencias o contradicciones personales. Son indicadores de poder y de éxito. Si a pesar de la actividad constructiva arrollada, aralo, al, aroladora, todavía quedan focos de protesta, inviten un arquitecto estrella a diseñar una estructura escalandosamente absurda y monstruosamente cara, justo adyacente a su más antigua catedral a su ayuntamiento o castillo. Los descontentos serán acalados en seco y el resto les aplaudirán como visionarios. Esto es eh, el pasado.
Eh, ahora hablo inglés. <laughs> Spain had for 2,000 years developed a unique quality of traditional building art and technology, the set of ideas which for centuries built and rebuilt Spain and its colonies, beautiful cities, villages and landscapes, survived the devastation of the civil war by only about 20 years. And yet, it is traditional architecture which became associated with the totalitarian Franco regime to this day, incorrectly, I think, obscuring the fact that it was modernism, and I mean modernism, not the Catalan modernism, but the modern movement. I always use that term because it's the correct one. We are all modern, whatever we do. But modernism is a specific form of uh, working in architecture and in art. So it was modernism which, in terms of building volume, doctrine, and duration, had triumphed under Franco, under the dictatorship. So it was modernism which, in fact, is the most symbolic and representative of Franco regime, whatever architects say. If traditional architecture and urbanism had flourished there for two decades, they actually produced hundreds of beautiful buildings, new towns and villages that still today can be admired in most regions, like Brunete or uh, there are so many, Garanejo, you have to, young people, you have to visit those. The, the rare, some of the rare success stories of modern urbanism were built in the late 1940s early 1950s. What happened then remains a mystery to me. The architectural profession, as if under a spell, converted to modernism with momentous effect for the whole country, for its cities and communities. I remember Spain very well from the late 70s and early 80s when many intelligent and talented people, and talented people recognized the catastrophe that modernism had meant for Spanish architecture and urbanism. Young architects and professors everywhere rediscovered that the old Spanish cities contained qualities and lessons which had been foolishly abandoned by their teachers. Research into forms and techniques of traditional architecture and urbanism were led at most universities, not merely for the sake of preservation, but in order to rebuild a doctrine and a technology shared as an anachronistic by the previous generation of professionals and thus vowed to oblivion. Then the second disaster of equal proportion happened in this country, this time devastating the brains of younger architects and intellectuals. Suddenly, as if overnight, a whole generation of professionals, after this brief period of questioning and research, converted back to modernist orthodoxy, a stealthy conversion, without loud declarations or confessions. When invited to Spain, I would now be faced by openly hostile hosts and aggressive audiences, not like here, uh, shouting and you know, rather unpleasant remarks. There were very few survivors of their second ideological holocaust. Rare places which have escaped catastrophic disfiguration like Cazares, Chinchon, Albaicin, Albarafin, Ubeda, Ronda, Ciudadela, all without exception, have been saved through the lifelong dedication and heroic, if little known, individuals. For most persons like Rafael Manzano Martos, who has worked rather obscurely at doing these extraordinary works, and uh, there are many professionals in these countries who are very little known amongst architects, like Donald Gray, uh, Jaime Parladé, Ignacio Medina, uh, and now Leopoldo Gil. There's a lot of uh, architects who have dedicated a lifetime to save their villages or their towns or some buildings, virtually without recognition. Now, it's a sign of really the better you are as an architect who restores buildings or builds modern buildings, the more successful you are at doing that, the less people will know about it. 
because you will be so sensitive at what you do that if you build in China, you don't build an Andalusian uh, finca. You know? And if you build in Andalusia, you don't build a Barcelona pavilion which was invented by a German for uh, a world exhibition. Because you are, as an architect, you are polyglot. If you are a true architect, you are sensitive to regional differences. And it is really that, uh, I think, the Rafael Manson Martos represents that personality, who has, with uh, enormous intelligence, extraordinary talent, worked in a way, uh, in, in a modest way, and uh, doing these extraordinary reconstructions and helping to maintain a language, I think. Now, um, a friend who grows coffee in Guatemala explained to me one day that uh, good coffee grows uh, according to altitude, climate, and above soil. And it is these three qualities, I think, not only which are good for coffee, but almost for anything you do, and particularly for architecture. And it is that, uh, those uh, factors, which have so much unified and create uh, typological and character orders in architecture which transcend, let's say, nations at all. There is no national architecture. There is an architecture of climate, soils, and, uh, and altitudes. And the architecture of the Basque country is much closer to that of, uh, of the Himalayas or of Tibet than it is to the plains 50 miles away uh, in the sands of the uh, Baie d'Arcachon. And this is extra extraordinarily powerful uh, geographic conditions which have created uh, this in incredible architectural variety of traditional architecture. And I think if you as architects once learn, and you are probably on the way to do that, you learn one language very well, and you understand its grammar, its syntax, and particularly its character, how what fits with what. You are almost by having learned one language well, in depth you know them all. Because unlike spoken language, <coughs> architectural language is not something which is submitted to casual hazards and uh, unpredictable things. It's really something which emerges from natural conditions by man of hand and by his intelligence. And therefore they are universal. And if you are trained in Spanish architecture in, in uh, Basque architecture, you know every the ins and outs of Basque architecture, you understand also Chinese architecture. You, Chinese, you understand pre-Columbian American architecture. It's a universal language. It does not need to be translated because in spoken language there is an enormous element of, uh, uh, of chance which defines character, local character. And in that sense it is absolutely fundamental to understand that um, baby speech, you know, young children who are born, uh, when they emit their first sounds, mama, papa, blah, 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 this is baby talk, you know, baby speech. Baby speech is universal. It's everywhere the same. And a baby born just in China, or one born in South America, or under an igloo, have the same speech. It's called baby talk, and it's universal. And then it's, again, climate, soil, and altitude, and of course the air which comes with it, uh, which define the morphology of, of the palace, of the palate, and which define languages. Whereas architecture doesn't do that. It, it remains universal. It doesn't need to be translated. That is why I think it's so absolutely fundamental that you, as architects, as also Raphael has explained, classicism and vernacular building languages are extremely easy to teach, to communicate, because they are based on experience, on logical premises. There is nothing hazardous or absurd about it. 
So it is these conditions which have been denied by what we call, I call, and I think is correctly called modernist architecture. Now, what is so different about modernist architecture? Why is not just another style? And that is what. The, so. Oh, oh, sorry. Where is <laughs> they all look the same, right? You know, in Spain, you didn't have the Nuremberg trials of architecture, but you had something very similar. And the extraordinary thing is that the same people who built under Franco traditional architecture became modernists. Very quickly, between 1955 and 1965, it all happened. Now, this happened without declaration. There were no manifestos of, of modernism in Spain uh, declaring that they are, you know, a new architecture against, against fascism or against dictatorship. They are the same architects who pretended that they were oppositional, who were already working the, the, the big projects under, under Franco and continued after the Franco regime. So don't believe the story that modernism is something of the left, of progress. It has nothing to do with that at all. No. Um, it's just an, a nice excuse that modernism is more democratic. It has nothing to do. There is more modernism built under dictatorships than classicism in the last hundred years. You can, and I've counted them. So, how to overcome this problem? Why, you know, when there is such an... Uh, no, what do I do? Oh, here. Uh, it's very important to know your recent history, to understand what is really uh, relevant about it, what is ideological, and what is technique. Now, architecture is, is different from uh, political ideologies because architecture is uh, particularly and precisely and irrevocably, traditional architecture, is a language, is a technical language. It's universal technical language, it's technology. And when people tell you that you can't do traditional architecture because it's something of the past, they are either ignorant, they are stupid, or they are bad. You pick your, your, your choice. Because it is not true. Traditional architecture is a technical language which transcends politics. And it's a, a language of construction. And therefore, it cannot be just attached to a regime. Because, after all, after the war, you know, it became, in our, in democratic countries, impossible to practice a traditional architecture without being slandered to be Nazi or left, uh, right wing or reactionary and so on. So you always wonder why there is not this problem with uh, uh, the technical apparatus which was used by dictatorships so successfully. The other story is because we live in the 21st century, we can't live in traditional homes, otherwise we are backward-looking. Now, there is no problem with backward-looking because all intelligence looks backward, constantly. In order to have to cook an egg properly, you have to look backward to the experience of cooking an egg properly. In order to speak, you have to use words which have been formed many, many generations before you, otherwise you cannot speak. So, to be a modern person, to be a progressive person, and to live in traditional house and practice traditional architecture are not contradictory. They are complementary uh, activities. Now, the trouble with architecture happened uh, many, many generations ago. And the great break which happened with traditional technique, with traditional technology of building, was really the, um, the incoming and the incredibly uh, powerful development of fossil fuels, first of coal and then of petrochemical uh, uh, energies. And it is these energies which transformed completely also uh, architecture. 
uh, modernist architects say that they are uh, paradigmatic changes which are irreversible. And they parallel these movements, these progressive movements in architecture to social progress, to progress in medical sciences or in science and technology. Whereas the fact is that uh, we now know that petrochemical energies are something which is related to maybe the last 200 years and that we are running out of them and that there's nothing to replace them. Whereas we won't hardly ever run out of wood, of stone, of brick, whether you fire it with low temperatures or high temperatures, and natural materials, which are the fundamental material of traditional technology of building. So traditional architecture is not the historic language. I'm not interested in it, the fact that traditional architecture, urbanism, are historic fact, facts. They are, anyway. But that is not defining them, that is not imprisoning them, that is not cutting them off from our times. It is traditional architecture, it's a technology, the technical knowledge of building with natural materials, more or less in the locality where you are, as a general condition. And then, even in past times, you know, the Romans, and even before, uh, would, uh, there was a great trade of very precious natural materials like marble and high quality stones, and they were traded around the Roman Empire. You had Italian marble, you find it in Spain and in northern Germany and so on. So, but as a general condition of building towns and houses and uh, building social fabric, buildings for the social, for the society, is the technique of building with natural materials where you find them, because that is the most energy efficient. And it is also that which creates this extraordinary uh, character, which the multiplicity of character of traditional architecture and the natural polyglotism which you have to uh, grow into as if you are good traditional architects. Now with the event of fossil fuels of coal first and, and then these colossal energies which followed directly on slave labor as a mode of production. And there's direct relationship between the use which our society is made of slave labor and then fossil fuel, uh, first coal and then petrochemical energies, which then replaced slave labor, more or less. No, slave labor was held far away as it is still now, but then became more comfortable not to have that because after all, as good Christians, slave labor is not that good. No, can't sleep that well with it. Um, so it was this new infusion of uh, these extraordinary energies which led architecture also into great trouble because there was suddenly an extreme confusion of where architecture is located, where it comes from, what what is its purpose? And for instance, when you look at this building, it looks like a monastery with a cathedral, but in fact, it's a private home of a famous English uh, eccentric. A great architect, James Wyatt, designed this Fontil Abbey. But it was a private home with a salon under the tower. So, at those times that was called a folly. But then these follies, the early 19th century, became the rule and uh, generally buildings, the character of buildings became systematically confused. That you may think this is a uh, mesquita, but in fact it's a technical building designed by, also by a great architect, Ludwig Persius, in Potsdam. And it's a pumping station for the waters of the uh, Sans Souci gardens, for the fountains. So it's of course, you know, when you think what if a mosque looked like this, if, if a pumping station looked like that, how do you design mosques which are going to come with a population no, changes? Uh, now this led to extreme excess, and when you look at the fabric, and I'm talking 
not only of uh, uh, Catalan modernism where everything is melting and becomes crazy and makes strange faces, but even classicism in the late 19th century became extremely overloaded, extreme. Everything became uh, adorned with columns and, and uh, girlands and, uh, and in a way it was a result of early mechanization of rep repetition of extremely mechanical uh, motives and the dissociation of the original themes which, with the forms and the uses. And it is, modernism was a revolt. Modernism, international uh, movement, was a revolt against this kind of excess of, um, of uh, classism and traditional cultures which had been uprooted. It had been, modernism had been preceded by arts and crafts and which started in England but also in, uh, uh, in Spain and in Portugal and in Italy and in Germany, there were everywhere extremely important uh, movements to rebuild the profession according to the logic of the craft, of the métier, of the techniques, so that the forms which are used have again a sense, are related to the materials you use and so on. So modernism was an extreme reaction against this kind of madness, which, um, do we have a, a pointer? Oh, you see on, on the, it's part of, ah, right. No. Oh dear. Fantastic. <laughs> and I push it. Yeah, okay. Uh, so this is, <clears throat> this is not a temple to some mad divinity, but it is just uh, an apartment block in Geneva. You have plenty of them in Madrid, you know, uh, Gran Via and so on. This extraordinary um, explosion of creativity. And creativity, when it is done with talent, is extremely attractive. But when it goes nuts, you know, it becomes unbearable. And not only are these buildings outside, the, the, the decline, the entire history and vocabulary of classicism, just for a few apartments. So what do you do if you have to design a temple to the gods? And, you know, what do you do for an opera house and so on? Of course, it was a language which was uh, played extremely well, but then decayed very quickly and with the First World War was virtually over because uh, the Belle Epoque was finished. But already before, and this was in the, on the left you have an, uh, uh, a Danish classicist called Eva Benson, also a very talented architect who designed this um, a project for an opera in, uh, in uh, Copenhagen, 1919, I think. Not only the opera, but also a national palace, office blocks, housing, all these buildings which you th think is the same stuff, the texture and rhythm, is the opera, a national palace, housing, offices. So you see, you have now an architecture. This was well before modern movement uh, became very important but there was like an extremely stripped down classicism. There was an, a, a, a reaction within uh, the traditional languages uh, leading to uh, an extreme abstraction which was needed to breathe again after this overkill of Victoriana and, uh, uh, and so on. And Miss van der Rohe, you know, doing a church here uh, in IIT in, in Chicago was a reaction against this sort of overkill. But then, when a church is designed like that, what do you do a warehouse? What is a warehouse supposed to look like? Exactly the same. And actually, Miss Van Roo designed a whole campus where, with virtually the same signature. Um, and it's another extreme. And this building, which you all know, which is greatly inspired by industrial uh, cranes and uh, machinery is supposed to be a culture palace. No. It's another form of eclecticism. 
It's a reaction. It's not a thought out, uh, um, rational uh, way of, of building an architectural language. And you see actually that most uh, so-called innovations which started by historicism in the 19th century where you had James Wyatt or Perseus or Schinkel and, and Richard Rogers and Corbusier and Miss Van der Rohe, Corbusier again, that the innovations in modernist architecture were in fact no innovations. They were just transferences, translations from forms which Corbusier found in, in boats or Miss Van der Rohe in, in warehouses applied to civil building. There is no innovation. If you, it's innovative for ignorant people, but if you know your sources, broad sources, you know where things come from. That is so interesting. If you are really uh, interested in architecture, you have to know it all. And it's all in your libraries, it's on the internet, you find it everywhere. And you discover very quickly what are the true, uh, what is the system with which you can build more than just a building which causes scandal. So there are within, uh, Traditional architecture is really an inventory of forms and words which are uncontrovertibly and universally and definitively linked and form a language of parts which allows you to do much more than a house but allows you to build streets, to build urban quarters, to build an entire territory, to build a people's architecture. And I count into this uh, classical and vernacular uh, vocabulary also modern industrial building because the cooling tower or the modern factory is, you don't find in history. You find similar forms uh, in maybe lime, uh, lime ovens or you find there is a nomenclature, there is an, uh, a, a typological and morphology line which goes throughout time, you find uh, these forms. And you find them even in the most modern aeroplanes. If you look at the, the most advanced aeroplane design, uh, the stealth aeroplanes, they are extraordinarily similar to a deep sea water fish in form and also the way they move. It's absolutely, there's no really innovation out of the blue. Now, and one of the problems of the late, uh, the last generation of architects is that they pretend that they have no sources. They are the source of their own invention. Um, Vivian Westwood, a famous English uh, clothes designer, said, I have not been influenced by anyone. And then she says, ironically, I am the Chanel of my generation not realizing that it's obviously she is an imitation of, she, she's imitating something. Um, everything we do is imitative. And the question is not whether you imitate or not, the question is whether you know what you are imitating. You are always imitating. How you speak, how you eat, how you build, how you walk, how you do make love, how everything is imitation. But imitation is not against originality, but it's the very foundation, it's a condition of originality. Because you as an individual cannot help being an individual. So you don't have to make efforts to be individual. You are an, an original anyway. So the way you speak and the way you draw and the way you use your computer is always very personal to you. So there is no worry to be more original uh, than, than yourself. Whereas uh, modernist architecture has produced uh, two forms of uniformity. One which is uh, uh, structural, which uses uh, structural elements like space uh, networks and uh, space structures in order to form uh, building types and then the building types are, are not really building types because they are related to pure construction and you need strong signage to make, to actually say what is a church and what is a gas station and what is an, a house and so on. And then there is the other uniformity where you have any kind of form which is used like Alva Alto using a vase which 
is really imitating an, uh, when you have, you cut a tree, no, a tree, you see this form exactly. And, uh, and that becomes with Alva Alto, becomes a vase with Norman Foster, it becomes an office building. Uh, Alto designed another theater, I think, for somewhere in, in Germany, which had these uh, funny shapes. But that is fine when one or two people do that, like when Corbusier did it in the 1950s, it was spectacular. It was really interesting, and it still is interesting. But if every single architect does that sort of thing, it becomes absolutely a chaos and absurd. Um, so the question of, of, uh, of doing good architecture is first of all to learn the, to understand what is the basic language. Now, architecture is an artifice. It's not something natural. It's not imitating nature in something you saw already directly. Architecture, actually traditional architecture, is the most artificial thing you can think of. There is no roof in, in, in nature to, to imitate. There are similar uh, structures, for instance, uh, you know, when you look at the skin of fishes, there is sometimes something which may resemble uh, roof covers and so on. Uh, but it's something very artificial. It's extremely modern, traditional architecture. It's nothing which has fallen from the sky. And it is very, very original and unique to humankind. Animals don't build that sort of architecture. Now, uh, these traditional elements, the roof, the tile, the door, the window, the, the house, they are nothing boring, they are nothing banal. It's only humans who can render them banal, or also sublimely beautiful. But it's this attempt of being creative, you know, inventing the house, inventing the new window, inventing this or that, which doesn't invent anything at all. Uh, if you know your sources, you know where they come from. And it's particularly uh, touching to see that all these architects who think they're incredibly original, they imitate each other, of course. So the most, the most original thing, if you are a really a strong individualist, is today to do traditional architecture, uh, to do it well. That's the most original thing to do, because it's done so little. What happened to architecture is a bit like uh, there had been a political regime which had declared that Spanish or traditional languages are a matter of the past and must no longer be used. Um, and then you have an Esperanto kind of new speak, which is imposed. Of course, within a generation, traditional languages would be forgotten. And then, if they are forgotten, you cannot speak them anymore. Because with modernist architects, it's always the argument that to do traditional architecture is too easy. Too easy. No, it's already all done. Un un until you try it, you see that it's really in... And if you haven't tried it, if you haven't learned it, you can't do it because you do it uh, full of mistakes and much worse than the mistakes which were uh, described by the Venetian architect, what was he called, the Errori degli Architetti. Now, uh, another uh, sign of modernity, which is related, I, I will explain why later, to the pat petrochemical uh, energies, is and what uh, Harold Bloom, he wrote this essay called the anxiety of influence. Like poets are extremely anxious not to be related to other poets. That they want to be originally the source of their own inspiration and so on, like Vivian Westwood. Now, uh, and there's this very moving instance where Frank Lloyd Wright, who, who suffered the same disease of extreme and absurd and uh, completely lunatic uh, need for originality, because <coughs> he was tiny, um, uh, during a concert of his students who played, he had evenings with music and there were students uh, who played in, um, sonatas by Vivaldi for violin and, and, uh, and cembalo. And during the, uh, the concert, Frank Lloyd Wright stood up and said, silent, silent. And the musician stopped and said, what is it, master? And he said, now I'm alone. And he was sort of in a tragic uh, situation. 
And they said, no, master, you are not alone. We are here to help you. And he said, no, idiots, you don't understand. Now I'm the only one. Because Bach has copied Vivaldi. And so I remained the only one. I thought we were two creators. Now I'm the only creator. So it is very interesting, this anxiety, this incredible angst to have been influenced, and the corollary, which is the will to power, the will to influence, the will to change the world. It's absolutely the same psychological twist. Um, and it is to do with totalitarian personality, you know, which reaches from Hitler to Picasso and Le Corbusier and all those people who thought they were uh, people who had created moments, paradigmatic moments of irreversibility. And it's of course nonsense. Uh, history is not something which is linear. Now what is, I think, what this country, which was very interesting uh, yesterday, Richard Driehaus uh, spoke at the Academy at the uh, Rafael Manzano prize giving, and he said, uh, have you realized how boring modern architecture is? Really, uh, he described the building he had in, in uh, an enormous building which went up in front of one of his houses in Chicago, and which is just made of one panel repeated uh, 150 meters high and 60 meters wide and 50 meters deep, this one and same panel. And once you have seen the panel, you have seen the building. There's no variety, there's no music, there's no theme, there's no variation. And James Gleick, who wrote an interesting book on uh, the chaos theory, popularizing, explaining the chaos theory, has a very interesting page on architecture. He says that when you see a classical building from afar, you see a shape, and then you approach it. In mid-distance, you see more shapes, and you approach it more, and you see, you no longer see the overall shape of the building, you now see the shape of the, uh, maybe the pavilion which uh, comes forward, and the pediment, and then the door, and then the, all these elements which add up to make a complex composition, which, is really replicating what you find in nature, because when I see a person down there, I don't see the eyes, I just see a shape you know, and the color. And then when I look here, I see beautiful eyes and hair and so on. And then mid-distance, I see just the masses of the hair. And it is this kind of enriching your experience as you approach a being, as you approach an object, as you approach either a plant or a person or anything in nature. It is an enrichment. As you approach, you get more information. Whereas when you see this kind of building in the, here in the middle, it's the same thing from afar and from close, and you put your nose on the corner, and you know nothing more about it. It's just an, an, a very large abstraction. And the only individuality it will gain is the damage which is sustained by this or the other panel falling off. Or it's like cars gain individuality by the scratches and the bumps you put in them. So it's really, that form of modernism is something contrary to human experience. It's uniformity which has to do typological uniformity, material uniformity, character uniformity, and then confusion where you need purely, and you have the extreme caricature in the theory of Venturi, that you, know, you decorate the box, you take any box and you put a sign in it, and it becomes a work of art. So we live really in times of great caricature, where uh, art is so bad that I want to found a society for an art-free world, because if you have museums so full of nonsensical works, just well not have them particularly if they are extremely expensive. Uh, so I think that uh, with petrol, petrochemical energy is now becoming extremely rare and becoming extremely expensive and more and uh, more uh, becoming uh, the property of very powerful military uh, empires that modernism is going to be something which is going to die out within the next probably two generations. And there will be a return to traditional architecture, whether we like it or not, 
just because we will have again to use natural materials which you find in locality. It's so moving when you look at real estate uh, uh, shop fronts and you know, real estate, they sell traditional homes. That's what people generally like. And then the architecture school, the Professor X and the Professor Z, and they have all a different signature, you know them. And it's the same in Madrid or in Barcelona or in Paris or in Beijing or anywhere. Now, traditional architecture is basically divided into vernacular building, which is generally pure technique with very little uh, art to it. Of course, a feeling of beauty, but without great rhetorics, does no rhetorics. There's poetry and elegance, but there is no great poetic discourse. There is no discourse in, uh, in uh, vernacular building. It's an, it's an architecture of pure building, of rooms, and it make, it's making the best of those uh, natural materials and of the rooms which society needs. Whereas a classicism is a translation of vernacular building technique into a language, but not any language. It's not the uh, postmodern language of architecture by Charles Jenks that has nothing to do with classicism. It's a language of construction alone, that all the element, the elemental uh, pieces, which are so clearly defined in uh, classical architecture, are to do, they speak, and they inform you about construction. And even Borromini, the, the wildest of the classes, are still buildings, are still language of construction. And it's the distinction between this vernacular and classism which built, I think, our societies and our social fabric and our conscience. Now, there's this extraordinary facade in the Nospedale in um, the Fratti, or whatever it's called, uh, forget, in Venice, where you have this very, very clear distinction of a classical temple front and then the vernacular of the, the canal facade. And in order to build a good town, you need those two uh, languages. Because if everything becomes classical, it's too much. And if everything is uh, vernacular, it, it becomes rather poor. But uh, on the right here, on your right, you have a barn in the Cotswolds in England where you see the wall, the roof, the pillars, the architrave, the, the beams, they speak only of themselves. I'm a beam, I'm an architrave, I'm uh, this and that. There is no rhetoric. Uh, the church on the left, what is missing is actually what is architecture. You see that th something is missing. The right is complete, nothing is missing, whereas on the left, you see there's class, classical architecture, but which is not yet fully expressed. And when you, you walk through your landscapes and villages and you begin to read uh, those distinctions, you, you will have a lot of information coming from, for you. Um, vernacular teaches itself. You can take apart the building, you understand the parts, you don't need anyone to explain to you. You, you know what an, a bracket or... An, uh, you know, oh, there's, that is the important thing is to learn, first of all, the forms related uh, to the words, and that you become fluent in those, because that is really what allows you also to become fluent in architectural language. Now, uh, traditionally, classicism is related to, in, in Europe for the last 3,000 years, to the building of religious or political buildings, to buildings of the collectivity, rather than uh, uh, to buildings of the family would generally be to do with uh, a vernacular building. And this you know very well, the, the tourist plans of cities where you have the cathedral and the town hall, they are drawn in three dimensions, whereas the private homes, they are just drawn as a color. And it is this distinction, I think, which we have to reclaim and which I think are the principal uh, instruments to create interesting cities today. Uh, and you don't need 1,000 years to build an interesting city. It can be done in three, four years, 
if you have a good client. And it is these public elements which form the silhouette, the skyline of the city. Now it is the, the civic elements, you know, the public elements, which are really the realm of classical architecture. The vernacular elements, which are the realm of the economy, the family economy, the, the industry. And it is the marriage of those two which create, I think, a powerful urban composition. We gave in Brussels for a while a prize where we, we gave a special prize to vernacular and one to classical, and these are the medals which illustrates it, to give consciousness how you know, that architecture is not all columns, it's not all uh, decoration. It, it needs, in order for decoration to be meaningful, it needs to have a, a vernacular setting in order to be powerful. And when you read uh, Adolf Loos's text, uh, Ornament and Crime, he did not say ornament is a crime, but it's a crime to have too much of it. No, it's actually a very interesting text. Uh, now, you need very little, and you can do it very quickly. For instance, this is my, my university at Yale, and that's a view from my hotel room, where everything you see here was built within 10 years by one single architect, James Gamble Rogers. Uh, and he uses... Uh, you know, this extraordinary, an architect can actually design a whole town without ever become boring, but you need to uh, have, make these distinctions. I lived for 20 years in a village in France where there was no architecture, it was just walls and uh, a few cornices, and uh, there were two or three columns in the church, but nothing more. Uh, a great architectural apparatus is really needed when you have more complex urban structures where the church and the you know, the market building and the town hall need to be something more than just in a few walls. And then you have, of course, the access, which Victoriana, Victorian, uh, Catalan modernism and so uh, created, where things go crazy, and then you need a period of calm. Now, on the left, you have an, a typical house in, uh, in uh, Mallorca, and you see how clearly the vernacular is a vernacular of construction using natural materials. Every piece there is authentic. There is a deep authenticity. It's wall deep. Whereas the building on the right is in some commercial housing outside Philadelphia, where it looks like a traditional home, but when you analyze it, it's actually, this is wood construction, two by fours, nailed, and the wall is just one inch deep brick glued onto the wall. And they sometimes fall off, so you see it. Uh, those windows don't open. They are nailed because there's air conditioning inside. And the shutters, you cannot close them because when you close them, you, it interferes with an, what is it? Is an architrave, is an archivolt? You don't know. It's just a box stuck on which says, I'm an architrave, I'm an archivolt. But it's fake. It's kitsch. Now, everything in this building is paper thin. It pretends to be something which it is not, and it falls off after a while. It's fake. Whereas here, you can have 300 years of wear and tear, and it still remains an authentic building because it's actually wall deep. Uh, now, this world is only possible with fossil fuel. Everything there is synthetic, it's synthetic materials. Without uh, uh, petrochemical machinery, you cannot have the modern balloon frame because it is hundreds of thousands of nails and the wood need to be cut ex exactly in, the, in two by four inches and so on. Uh, otherwise, you can't do that sort of uh, framing. Uh, without fossil fuel, all that will die. You won't have steel in large mass, you will still have metal and and maybe some concrete, but you will have it in very small quantity and at very, very great expense. So the age of, of modernist architecture comes to an end. And the problem with, if you study and if you work in traditional architecture, the problem is not the modernist, modernism, the problem is the fake traditional. Because the building industry is now trained to use synthetic materials. They don't know about uh, natural materials, 
even if they are surrounded by mountains of stone and forests. And one of the great jobs of every great architect, traditional architect, and that is why Irene showed uh, uh, Raphael uh, talking to his craftsmen, is to first of all form the craftsmen who are going to build your buildings because they need to use the same language, they need to know the techniques, they need to know the character of the materials to choose the right stone for the right place and the well-cooked brick and so on. So it is an extraordinary uh, métier which links both the vernacular and the classical, the craftsman and the architect, and they need each other. Uh, I did a book in America uh, with uh, friends which is called Get Your House Right because mostly houses in America are built this way. It's all fake, you know, stuck on, uh, plastic, old fibrous plaster, and after a few years it all wobbles and, uh, and this is how to correct this. You know, and it's, it's a fairly thick book. And how to recognize the fake. You always see the things breaking away. You know, the, the fake shows very quickly. Uh, the arch is just glued on. The material is extremely paper thin, whereas the true uh, uh, material of, of architecture has to be authentically deep. And this is all possible because uh, steel and, uh, and concrete are materials, are mass materials, but they are materials which are extremely energy voracious. And if you drive around your country, you will see when you approach uh, Valencia or you drive north of Barcelona or out of Malaga or wherever you drive, you have these colossal, immense factories for either steel or concrete. So concrete is not a banal material. It's an extremely precious material. It is incredibly energy uh, uh, rich, and it should not be wasted on banal structures. So it's, it's something, uh, there is also a hierarchy in the value of the materials, and sooner or later the energy which went into these materials to produce them will count. The aluminum will be extremely uh, dear in 20 years. It's the most expensive energy-wise, whereas wood will be more or less the same than, than it always was. And it's really the condition we have to struggle with, this intermediate period of being in, in, uh, working with uh, workers and, and craftsmen who don't know the craft. So you can draw whatever you like. They rarely look at your drawing. And if you have some building experience, I see some people smile. It's the funniest thing which you see on the building sites. Now, I went with a series of students uh, of the Prince of Wales School. We were in Bagnaia in in Italy, which is a very charming town, which has very ugly extension. And, but it's very nice. It's ugly but nice. It's three-story high buildings, two-story high buildings. People are happy. It's just ugly like hell, but it's Italy. And so you had a beautiful central town and a beautiful and this horrendous suburb. The students had to learn in one day all the elements which were making the traditional town, the windows, the doors, the uh, the, the wall fabric, the arches, the, the chimneys, all the elements had to be ordered in a lexicon of good and bad examples. A good and a bad door, good and bad chimney, and so on. This took one day, and we had a real lexicon. And then we placed them in several locations where you see still that it's a beautiful place in the background, but you have horrendous buildings in the foreground and so on. The lampposts were not bad, now they are much worse and twice as high and three times more numerous, of course. Uh, and then they had to draw and I, I beg you to, wherever you are, wherever you grew up, just sit outside and draw where you are, what has happened to your villages. And to draw whatever you see, not make, don't make it more beautiful, but with all the ugly stuff which has accumulated over the last 20 years. It's that which is the most difficult, because your eye, you don't see the ugly stuff. And it took, instead of one day to draw this drawing, it took like four days. And then they had to transform the ugly drawing into a nice drawing, that's the ugly one, with 
the elements they had learned uh, by creating this lexicon. And it's a fantastic exercise. In the beginning, they didn't like it, but in the end, you become like machines for improving the world. Because there are areas which cannot be saved. You just have to blow them up or just abandon them. But most villages here in Spain, small towns, are often very ugly, but they have a good scale. They are very boring, manzanas over manzanas, but they still have shops on the ground floor. So those are areas which can be easily improved. And the better you are at it, the least people will notice. Because they will think, when it's beautiful again, they think, oh, this is nice. It has always been like that. Now, uh, because we talk also about restoration, but I don't make a great difference between restoration. I think if you study restoration, it's really one of the rare uh, curricula where you can learn traditional building. You, don't, you are not taught uh, traditional building methods in the normal uh, uh, architecture courses. Uh, now, it's very interesting because the Charter of Venice, you have all to study the Charter of Venice and study it as a toxic, very toxic text. It's absolute a disaster because it claims that when you do any intervention in a historic building, which they call historic, historic, so past, finished, now we have to modernize, it says that any uh, intervention you do had, have to be different in material, in color, in proportion, in character, in, um, uh, in so many ways, which means an obligatory rape of traditional constructions. And that is what ha has not only happened in Venice, but happens around the world. And that is what I think we need to reform. Now, interestingly, the people who wrote this uh, are virtually the same people who have created um, uh, uh, what is called the uh, Docomomo, the, uh, which is the preservation of modernist buildings. You know. And there they want extreme conservative restoration. You must exactly research what Miss van der Rohe meant in 1929. Don't innovate. No. It must be a reproduction, conservative uh, reproduction of the original. So it's so moving that the people who claim that every historic building must be raped are so conservative when, it, when they uh, restore uh, modernist buildings. And I like also uh, conservative restoration of good modernist buildings because they can be charming, uh, and so on. So nowadays, it's very, uh, most historic restoration, I did this uh, a while ago, and now there's a building like that. The army museum in Dresden is exactly like this. A beautiful Bozar building cut in two by some dreadful shape. Whereas when you are, that's a historic building, you restore it very well, there is no glory. No, people will think it has always been like that. Uh, and then, of course, uh, innovating uh, in a historic context. I, you know, everyone asked for about five years, what do you think of the pyramid of IMP in the Louvre? I think nothing at all. I think it's, it's a rather poor uh, thing, and the Louvre was much better without it. But to prove it, I collaged it into a suburb of Paris, and nobody would speak of it if it was in such an environment. Now, the famous thing which modernism became famous for, which is dynamism of form, moving forward, you know, uh, dynamic um, uh, compositions, imitating machinery, you can do it in traditional architecture. I translated the building by Frank Lloyd Wright for Ayn Rand in a traditional mode. And it's very, very interesting to do that. Uh, I do a course where we take Corbusier buildings, small scale, not the big stuff, three-story buildings, and we change them into traditional structures. You find that actually maintaining the spirit of Le Corbusier, that in fact the interesting stuff about Le Corbusier is traditional ideas. It's not uh, being crazy. Uh, if uh, restore, people who restore paintings had the same attitude than architects who restore buildings. That's what they would do with Benozzo Gozzoli and, uh, and Leonardo and Claude Lorrain. Uh, the problem with uh, European classism is that we live the, exam the exemplar of traditional architecture in ruin and I'm all for reconstructing those exemplar integrally with the original material because the quarries are still there. And now they do a sort of dentistry which is absurd and extremely costing. Uh, 
uh, and people prefer actually to look at ruins rather than at, at uh, uh, intact traditional buildings. This is a strange perversion. Whereas there's a lesson to be learned from Japan where you have this Ise shrine in Ise, which is an imperial shrine in Ise, is rebuilt every 20 years according to the same plan with exactly the same material according to a ritualized uh, uh, process of building and shaping. And it is an extraordinary uh, event to see. You can't see the main building because it's uh, sacred. It's behind Temenos wall. You can't see it. But you see other buildings around it. And uh, it is... It reminds me, once that building is new every 20 years, it's like a newborn, it's a baby, and it has the same sexual expression, this incredible tenderness, beauty of freshness. It's new, it's thousand years old, but it's new. <laughs> Babies are million years old, but they are new, and that's exactly what architecture is also about, that we use, that is when it is you know, there are two places for the Ise Shrine. Uh, that is, when it's built, it lasts 20 years, and an empty site here, which in 20 years, they built a new one, and then demolish the old one, and it becomes relics for the Imperial Shrine around the world. And it is, I think it's, it's a very interesting uh, metaphor for the renewal of life an allegory for the generational renewal of life. Every 20 years you have a new, uh, new run. And the small town of Ise uh, is also a traditional town. And amusingly, when you look behind, it's actually a fake traditional town. Because see, it was a horrible Japanese town, like most Japanese towns. And they wrapped it with traditional um, wood. Uh, this is in a Buddha temple in Nara. And it's interesting because it's a, a le another lesson in preservation. It had burned down uh, in 1680s, I think, and it had two enormous pagodas, 100 meters high. Uh, and it was, and this was rebuilt in the years after the destruction, exactly like the original, but 20% smaller, because they couldn't afford the original building. <laughs> and it is a similar, you know, the extraordinary, all the wood came from China. And the original pagodas, they didn't rebuild them, but was a hundred meter long high tower, which is a single uh, piece of wood, which had to come from China, because only in China you had these enormous uh, sycamore trees. Uh, no, what are they called? Yes. Are they sycamore? No. The, the, the gigantic uh, trees. Uh, this is a building. Uh, the, it's the capital building in uh, Williamsburg. If g you go to America, don't go to New York. Go first to Williamsburg. It's the best new town in America, which was entirely rebuilt in the 1920s, uh, imitating the original Williamsburg of the uh, pre-revolutionary America. And it is a museum of vernacular and classical architecture like there is nowhere in the world. It's absolute perfection. There's such a richness of detail you cannot imagine. And this building was reinvented from an, uh, a small drawing which was found in the Bodleian Library in, in Oxford by one of the researching um, architects. And it's a complete invention that actually in traditional architecture, when you imitate, you also invent because you cannot reproduce the past. It's impossible. It's never the same. You encounter very diff different materials, you encounter different craftsmen. There's always something which uh, makes it different. Uh, this is a set of buildings which was rebuilt 20 years ago against the jury, the architect's jury who had decided to put a row of modern buildings, decided by the mayor, by uh, uh, Michel Schirmacher. Uh, this is the, an, a project for rebuilding the castle in Berlin, uh, which architects and artists opposed now for 30 years. Now it's going to be done. Because even the, the, the German Chancellor had voted for it, and it was opposed by, uh, by architects. He said, you cannot repeat the past, but it's going to be done. So again, 
The important thing, the vernacular building and classical architecture, they are the same family, but they are of, of different uh, uh, grade of elaboration. Uh, what is often when you do it today is that you have, uh, you know, this is the relationship, the classical relationship of the vernacular shed and the temple. And the temple, which is a much larger building, which is not just for the gods, but also for men, and it has to be seen from afar, and to be beautiful, not only from close, but also from afar, and there's this whole articulation of architectural parts in a different, more lasting material than the original, is to do also that public buildings are bigger than private buildings, should be bigger than private buildings. And therefore, just by, if you were just enlarging vernacular building, you would have very crude structures. So when you enlarge a building, you also need a different, a different language. And there are so many layers where you can interpret uh, a rich interpretation of vernacular and classical. This is, would happen what you often see, that kitsch imitations of classical buildings, they are like these midget uh, Mickey Mouse classical buildings in the suburbs, whereas this would be like a, an, an enormous hotel, a cottage hotel, whereas, so this palace size cottage vernacular and uh, cottage size a palace architecture, where's the real thing? You really need that language because you have different sizes, different scale, different emphasis, rhetoric and art instead of just technology. And then the excess, this would be the ideal situation where you have a mix of classical and vernacular. You all know from New York, the St. Patrick's Cathedral down Fifth Avenue, how ridiculous it cows in the shade of these monsters this is private imperialism, and this is public imperialism, and this is good civic building. This is under communism where architecture became so vast and everything, everything becomes public, even your toilet is a public, private toilet is a public building, uh, where there's such an excess, there is no more uh, uh, golden mean. Now, the interesting thing about uh, synthetic materials are... Uh, create structures which are very different by nature to most of traditional architecture, not all. That you can take Le Corbusier's Villa Savoie, put it on its back or on the side, and it's still a fine building. No, it's, it's uh, what one calls hypostatic. It doesn't depend, you can throw it through the air and it stays the same. Uh, a traditional building if you put it on the side, it just collapses because the whole thing is isostatic. The material is handled by humans or by instruments and formed in, in a solid bound to create architecture. And that is architecture. It's a human artifice. Now, modern, most modernist architecture is something which is without scale and without size because you can, have, you can repeat the element at infinitum, so to speak, you can't, but in fact that's what architects do, and then they have an expansion joint every 30 meters. But in principle, it goes at infinitum, and it, has no, no, it doesn't respond to gravity, whereas traditional architecture is something to do with gravity, fundamentally. So here we are. Corbusier condemned traditional building, uh, black, no, it's not good, you must abandon this. This is the past. The future is the five points of architecture, the free plan, the strip window, the roof garden, the free ground floor, and so on. Five points. Now, I reversed this. Corbusier is bad. Traditional architecture is good. But we are not idiots. I mean, Corbusier was a good architect, and it's very interesting to look at him. And we always go. And some of it is really good. But we don't practice it because it's perverse. It cannot be sustained over a long period of time and you cannot build a society with Corbusier or with Miss Van der Rohe or with Frank Lloyd Wright. You need traditional architecture. For the moment, we are in a situation of tolerance. I think we should generally see that they are just different techniques. Traditional technology is to do with handling natural materials, whereas uh, high-tech technology recent technologies, synthetic technologies, have to do with synthetic materials, but we shouldn't be religious about it. I mean, we all have to use synthetic materials if we want to build, otherwise nothing gets built. You know. um, 
It's not a matter of uh, religion. But it's these kind of uh, isostatic structures, which I think you have to be highly aware of in, in how far they are different. And that is why behind uh, Frank Geary on Libeskind, all the star architects today, it's the same structure. You look behind the facade and it's the same stuff, structurally. Whether it's leaning or, or, or bending, it's the same stuff. Now the amusing thing is that you, know, you have the same structure here, the domino system, going up in two neighboring lots. And you only see in the last three months whether it's going to be a new traditional or new modernist building. And they are both fake. Most modernism is fake, it's nothing to do with authentic. There is no authentic form to modern architecture. It's generally imitations of industrial building, of industrial machinery, of industrial vehicles. It's not an invention which you could say in authentic language. The trebiation is not more modern than the archivolting. If you shoot a hole in a concrete wall, it's going to be round. It's going to be an arch. It's not going to be a square window. So the square is not more modern or more natural uh, or more progressive than the round. I think, I think I must have been wearing you out. But this, I'm going now very quickly. Uh, so this is a condition we are in a fossil fuel. We are now probably over oil peak. It's very important that you type in your internet oil peak. You read about oil peak, oil peak. It's the moment of maximum extra extraction of fossil fuels. All we do depends on most things we do uh, in our lives now, agriculture, architecture, travel, depends on fossil fuel. Very little traditional building, maximum of modernist building, and oil peak is not going to be a smooth ride downwards like we came up to oil peak. It's going to be, and we are in the first one, of these very brutal collapses. And it's going to be extremely cruel, not just for us, but for most countries. And it's only very privileged people which are going to survive this elegantly. So, uh, it's fossil fuel which have caused, not, not talking about climate change, but have caused our lives to spend the maximum of time, energy, land and air to do rather banal lives. So I think a return to traditional crafts and arts is the only true ecological project because the, industrial, the progressive industrialization of the entire world is not possible. And you can do this today. I'm involved in many projects, Monsanto Martos builds everywhere, traditional buildings. There is in America a movement called New Urbanism <coughs> where hundreds of new cities are built in traditional ways. In this country, there are some architects who have been hiding, Donald Gray, uh, very extraordinary in Marbella, Lomas de Marbella, go to see Lomas de Marbella Club, fantastic, a new development built in the 1970s, which is as good as any old architecture. I mean, it's truly traditional architecture. I'm involved with this project for the Prince of Wales in England. We are building now, we have been building for 15 years, and it's <coughs> going to be complete another 15 years. This very large, a segment of Rome, we are demolishing housing, modernist housing for 28,000 people. Uh, 18 tower blocks and 60 slab blocks, like you have here in the peripheries now. And uh, because the only economic way is to take them down and rebuild new town. It's too expensive to maintain them. And it's entirely unecological. And this is a project which is going up in Guatemala all in concrete, <laughs> couldn't help it. The, the, it's the industry dominates so much and the family who own the land, they are involved with this industry. But you can do extraordinary building in concrete. Uh, Reggio Calabria was destroyed in 1911 by an enormous earthquake which also destroyed Messina. It was entirely rebuilt in concrete, in steel reinforced concrete. It's a rather pleasant town. It doesn't need to be ugly blocks uh, 20 stories high. It's all three stories high with nice piazzas and it's, it's a fine Italian town. So it is the material uh, question you need to understand to, to know where you are. 
And because if you practice this, you are being treated like an outcast by, by the profession. And uh, the Driehaus Prize is an abs absolutely extraordinary event because the architects who win the Driehaus Prize, they would never get the Pritzker Prize because the Pritzker Prize are militantly and religiously and transcendentally modernist because they don't understand what modernism is about. That it is a passing event, that it purely relates to uh, rich availability of fossil fuels and that we are coming to an end of it and thanks God for it. Meanwhile, we should enjoy it rather than be too moralistic about it. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Questions? Ya sé que es la hora, pero si tenéis alguna pregunta, aprovechad que ampliamos un poquito el tiempo. Bueno, pues muchas, muchas gracias, León. Gracias a ustedes. Y muchas gracias, Rafael. Rafael, ¿quieres decir algo más? ¿Tenéis alguna pregunta para Rafael? I was in, in I was in China with friends and the only question which we got from the room was Massimo Scolari was asked by a gentleman who dared to ask a question he said how do you become famous? No <laughs> 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 unir estas charlas o lo que sea, hay un curso, ¿no?, de aquí en la escuela, de, un curso de restauración de momentos, ¿no? Sí, sí, están muchos alumnos de, de restauración. Ahí. Yo quiero venir que me inviten Eso a... Eso no, no depende de mí, a... <risa> pero te invitarán, seguro. Y, y tener una más larga presencia en esta casa, que sí, Vengo casi todos los años, doy una conferencia, me voy, pero no hay una demasiada excesiva continuidad. Me gustaría más estar en clase del proyecto. Pero yo creo que era donde había que estar y donde teníamos que estar todos, profesores y alumnos, meditando sobre el pasado y sobre el futuro. Muchas gracias. Muchas gracias a todos por haber venido. Muchísimas gracias.